Do you think this is going to fool them into thinking I recorded these all on separate days? <laughs> no? Do you think they're going to think I'm actually talking to someone off camera? Welcome back, y'all. It's mammal time. Uh, we're about to take a look into the class of animals that we belong to. Um, we've got a lot of close relatives in here that don't look a thing like us. So, let's get started. Your first observation in class mammalia is not all entirely in class mammalia. We're just looking at the differences in skull and brain morphology across different vertebrate groups. Now we've already seen all of these vertebrates. Uh, I've seen them today. You've seen them across the course of several weeks. Um, so what we have here are a bony fish, a frog, a turtle, a bird, this is a pigeon, uh, and uh, a rabbit. That is, yes, uh, either, I think this might actually be a rat. This is a rat. So you have fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal. Um, take a look at those. Note their differences and their similarities. Hold on, you can see them face on that way if you want. Um, and then take a look at their differences in brains. The reason I say ra said rabbit before is because um, this particular mammal here is a rabbit. So we've got a fish brain, the smallest of and uh, most uh, basic of them all. Then you've got a frog brain, a snake brain, this is our reptile representative, a, a pigeon brain, and then a rabbit brain. You'll notice that mammal brains are far larger and uh, more complex. This is the underside, this is the top. Uh, more uh, larger and more complex than uh, any of the other groups. So something, something cool to note there. Now we've compared the skulls and the brains. I want to compare one more thing as well. In procedure two, we're going to take a look at the heart. All right. So um, here we have a similar setup where we look at the hearts of each of these creatures going through evolutionary time. All right. So right here we have the hearts of a perch, a fish, just like the one uh, we dissected last week, um, a frog. This one here is a, a snake, a snake heart. That's a bird's heart. You're starting to get much more complex, right? Um, and then that's a mammalian heart. This is a, uh, a pig heart. And I'm going to take a moment here to explain why we use pigs as our, as our mammalian specimens for dissections and things. Uh, pigs are one of the, anatomically, one of the closest animals to us uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, for that reason, uh, we use pigs in a lot of studies where we would have to figure out what the effects on a human body would be. We use pigs. Um, and so that's why we use dis dissections. Because we, that's why we use pigs for dissections, because uh, they're so very similar anatomically to us. Uh, so you get kind of an idea of what the human body's like, only you're dissecting a pig. or looking at pig hearts and brains and stuff. All right, procedure three. Uh, we're going to look at our first whole-mounted uh, mammal here. And this is from the order Chiroptera. This is a bat, specifically a Japanese house bat. Now, the reason we look at bats in our mammal lab um, quite a lot, actually, we'll look at some other bat stuff in a minute, is because they're very unique among mammals. As you know, they are the only mammals capable of true, sustained flight. Uh, there are mammals who can glide through the air, but uh, bats are the only ones capable of, of actual flight without an airplane, right? We can fly, but... Uh, not uh, just by flapping our wings. Um, 
It wouldn't be a semester of a science class without talking about rats and, and rodents in general, because rats and other rodents have been a very popular lab animal for a very long time. They're uh, small, they reproduce quickly, they are uh, easy to keep alive in a lab, and uh, they model a lot of the same anatomical features and even uh, psychological features of a higher mammal like ourselves. So they've been very popular as lab animals because of that. I have right here a white lab mouse, um, but I'm going to show you the internal anatomy of a rat here just a second. All right, here is our rat. Um, you'll note that they have all of the same basic uh, anatomical structures as you would see in a human, or you'll see in the dissection uh, pig, right? Um, you can see lungs, you can see uh, the heart right there in the middle, you can see uh, a multi-lobed liver, stomach, intestinal tract over here, it's been moved off to the side. So all of this is uh, very akin to what you would see in a dissected pig or in uh, the human body. Um, just another clear example of why rats have been very popular laboratory animals for a very long time. Now, embryonic development um, is a big area of study in science. and. Uh, Pigs, once again, make a great example for this because their embryonic development follows very similarly uh, to our own. All right? um, I, want you to, I want to show you up close these stages. Actually, yeah, there we go. We'll show you from this side. Okay, so the, the smallest one over here is at uh, 15 days of development. Is that in focus? Yeah. Smallest one's at 15 days of development. The second smallest is at 20 days. It's uh, jumped up, it's grown about two millimeters. Then this one is at 30 days of development. And then at 40 days. So 10, 20, 30, 40 days of development for a pig. Um, we have a couple more right here. This one is uh, at, okay, let me see if I can't show you that one there. There, there's his head, there's his limbs. This one is at uh, 59 days of development, okay? They do have a much shorter um, gestation than we do, uh, so it's, it's a little bit accelerated for, for what we would have. But uh, this is at a pig at, at, a, at 59, 60 days. And then um, this one here is at uh, 62 days. And you can see it's got uh, some placenta there with it, uh, very nicely displayed in this black box. Um, I'll show you a dissected uh, specimen here in a little while um, for, for a, a later procedure. Uh, expertly dissected thing, just like we've looked at expertly dissected versions of all these dissection specimens. Uh, that one is a little bit later, that one's at 80 days. So um, I'll, I'll bring that up again when we see it. We have so many specimens of mammals in this lab that I want to spend a little bit of time just quickly comparing and contrasting a few of them in, uh, in a segment we'll call uh, um, okay. I can't think of a name right now, but it's about convergent evolution. You've seen convergent evolution in action probably already in lecture. Uh, this is when two organisms that are not closely related to each other at all wind up with similar traits um, because they work pretty well. Um, we're going to look here at x-rays of a rabbit and a kangaroo. There you have them. Um, they have some very similar traits to each other, uh, not just in uh, the structure of their limbs and their bodies, uh, but in the structure of their skulls. And I have some skulls here to look at. This is a this is a kangaroo that's kind of eating its own tag there. 
Uh, There's a kangaroo skull, and that is a rabbit skull. You take a look at them, even in their skulls, they exhibit similar morphologies. They have grinding teeth in the back, large eye sockets, uh, some, some teeth in the front for tearing, uh, tearing things. Uh, not closely related at all, uh, right? A, a kangaroo is a marsupial, which is not related to any of the placental mammals uh, at all. This, uh, this rabbit is more closely related to an elephant than it is to uh, a kangaroo. And yet they're, they're, they exhibit such structural similarities, uh, both in their general body plan and in their skulls. But I have some more examples. We have three uh, meat-eating creatures here. And they, all of their skulls, at first glance, look fairly similar. I mean, you look at that skull and this skull, and they both have the protruding sharp teeth in the front, so does this one, and some uh, sharp carnassial teeth in the back for shredding meat. Uh, but they're all, they all are very different animals. So this is procedures seven, eight, and nine. We have a California sea lion skull over here. This is a uh, eight times life size scale of a vampire bat. It's scaled up, but since it's scaled up, it looks a lot like the Rottweiler dog to me. Uh, they have very similar features. So uh, just make some notes about their overall skull structure. Um, it says, talk about the sagittal crest on the California sea lion. That's this crest here. You can see it a little bit on this guy, but uh, you can also see it here. That's where those jaw muscles will come up and attach. So the larger the sagittal crest, the more powerful the jaw uh, muscles. And that goes for all mammals. And we'll see that a few more times. Our next procedure, procedure 10, is another example of evolution in action. So, all mammals have the same basic um, skeletal structure for their forelimbs. There is a solid upper limb bone, two uh, separate lower limb bones, then a bunch of small bones for the hand and finger bones. Um, this here is a dolphin pectoral fin that follows that pattern. You have the flipper of a manatee, same pattern, solid upper bone, two bones in the lower arm, then small bones in the hand, and then finger bones. And over here, an extreme example of evolution, uh, also exhibited with its skull, a fruit bat solid upper arm bone. Two, you can see that one of them is very fine, but there are two lower limb bones, some very small bones in the hand, and then uh, the same exact number of finger bones. They're just spread out differently. So take a look at the three of these organisms and uh, make some observations and compare and contrast, uh, specifically their arm bones, but if you'd like you can compare and contrast uh, their skulls as well, since we do have, since we do have those. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, procedure 11 involves these teeny tiny little replica uh, skulls, as if we didn't have enough skulls in here. Look, there's a mammoth. We have a, we have a mammoth full-size skull. We I mean, don't need to take much time to look at uh, the tiny plastic toy skulls that we have in one of our drawers. Uh, so omit that one. Go ahead and write omit underneath procedure 11 because they're just little plastic. Look, here's a rhino. There's a rhino. I mean, you don't... There you go. Uh, omit that one. It's, it's just some little plastic toys. Our next procedure is our two uh, fossil cats here. Our Smilodon, or saber-toothed cat, and our American Lion. Um, the Smilodon, so basically for your procedure, just uh, take notes on, on their general morphology, note some different differences in them, and go ahead and just, and just, uh, and just take a look at these things. Uh, the Smilodon lived uh, 13,000 years ago. This particular skull is from the largest and most complete saber-toothed cat. 
uh, found at Rancho La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. Uh, the jaw, as well as the sabers, were found associated with the skull. Uh, so identify similarities and differences between this skull and uh, the, the lion's skull. This skull is the American lion, uh, lived about 14,000 years ago. They, lived a, they, lived, they were around a long time. This particular one was uh, found from 14,000 years ago in uh, La Brea Tar Pits. Um, and it's the, uh, the largest of all cat species that we know of. And it could weigh in at about 900 pounds, three times larger than uh, the modern lions. So very cool. We've got the American lion and the saber-toothed cat for you. And our last specimen for this video is the expertly dissected fetal pig. Now, as I mentioned before, this specimen is at 80 days of development. Uh, it's still considerably smaller than the specimens that we dissect here in the lab. But uh, it's, you can see it has all of the uh, basic anatomy parts already built in. All it has to do now is, is grow and get bigger. Um, it's got, at this stage of development, it already has a fully developed heart and lungs and liver and stomach and uh, intestinal tract and everything. Uh, so you can see uh, very clearly against this very um, <laughs> interesting orange background. It's, uh, it's giving me Moody Gardens flashbacks. The, the color, not the pig. We, we wore this, we wore this coat, never mind. Anyway guys, that's the end of mammals. Um, hopefully you'll have a pig dissection video to watch and fill out with your, uh, uh, the rest of your handout. Um, but uh, until then, I, until next week, and next week is our last lab. Um, yay! Last lab for me for today. Um, so yeah, primates will be our next lab next week, and I, uh, I think it's going to be a fun one. I think you'll like it. Until then, I am as I ever am.